welcome to another session of uh, microcontroller. Today we are going to look at uh, a process control system and we are going to start by defining what process control system is. So process control system can be defined as the functions that and operations uh, that are necessary to change a material either physically or chemically. So when a material is changed either physically or chemically, then we talk of a process control. For example, you can talk of uh, uh, changing uh, of, of uh, uh, water bottling plant whereby you remove the impurities. So in that case, you have changed uh, the chemical uh, nature of the water that was there before. So there is the chemical uh, change. Uh, so that is what the process control is. And every process usually ha must have one or two uh, one or more control variables and also they must also have one or more manipulated variables. So just to look at a diagram of a simple process control, we are going to look at, uh, let's look at a block diagram of a simple process control so that uh, we can understand what the process control is all about. So this is the diagram of the process control. So here we can have a comparator, then we have a controller. We have a controller, then at this point we can have that, that goes to the final control element. goes to the final control element, then here we can have the process. Then we have the disturbance. The variables. So here we have the output controller. We have the output controller, then at this point we can have that one going back to the measuring means uh, because in most cases there is always a difference in uh, the input and the output may not be of the same dimension and also with the physical quantity, we may have a physical quantity then it has to be converted. So in this case, we can have measuring means. Then here, we have the measured variable or the measured value of the control variable. Or the controlled variable. Then this one goes back to the comparator. So at this point we have the set point, set point SP, then we have the manipulated variable M here, we have manipulated variable which is always referred to as M, then we have the final control element here which is at times we can refer to it as actuator, final control element. This is the error detector that compares, it does the comparison of what comes to the output. You can see that the measuring means is at the feedback. So in case there is a difference between the input and the output, uh, then the comparator will give the signal and then the signal will, the difference will go to the, the, to the controller. The controller is simply uh, uh, an amplifying agent that is going to amplify uh, whatever signal, the difference that is there in order to bring about the corrective mechanism that will be a, realized at the final control element. So that is a simple block diagram of a process uh, control system and uh, a little bit of explanation. So when you talk about all 
the process control system, all processes usually have uh, three important requirements. There are three important requirements that uh, each and every process must have. So we have three pro important requirements. The one, the first requirement that is always important is the measurement that is supposed to be made by a sensor. So the first one is the measurement that is supposed to be measured by use of a sensor, or we can refer to it as the measuring, as the aspect of measuring the control variables. So we can talk of the measurement made by the sensor. So the measurement is always made by the sensor. Measurement made by a sensor or transducer or transducer, or we can simply refer to it as the measure, measurement of controlled variable, of controlled variable, measurement of a controlled variable. The second one that we can also have, there has to be a means of comparison, or we can refer to it as evaluation. We must be able to, to evaluate the information that comes from the sensor, and this one is always is done in, by, by comparing, uh, it is always done by comparing the sensor signal with the reference set point. So the set point, maybe you can talk of a temperature of let's say 60 degrees. And then the difference that will be at the output will be compared there. And then that difference will be here. And then it will be taken for amplification. And because, uh, and later on we'll be talking about the controller modes or the modes of control that can be used in that case. So number two, we've talked of the evaluation. We talk of evaluation. And the evaluation is always as a result of the controller usually needs, controller usually needs uh, to evaluate information, is to evaluate information needs to evaluate information from the sensor. It needs to evaluate information from the sensor. And it surely does so by comparing. So it does so by comparing. That is by comparing. It does so by comparing uh, what is always in the sensor signal. That is the sensor signal with the reference input or set point. Comparing uh, sensor signal with the reference input or what we refer to as the set point. Then the third uh, requirement that each and every control uh, system should have is what we should refer to as the corrective mechanism or rather the, uh, the final control element. That is the actuator that is going to bring about the correction it's going to bring about the correction, corrective mechanism whereby if there is a, a slight difference, then it is going to ensure that that difference is made to be as small as possible so that the difference between the output and the input can be as small as possible. But in most cases, uh, when you talk about such like systems, the difference can, uh, at times the difference can be zero, but if you talk of now the servo systems, the difference will never be zero because that is what uh, makes the system to work. So those are the three very, very important uh, requirements that are always uh, uh, found in a process. So let's look at uh, the process characteristics. Let's look at process characteristics. So what are the characteristics that a process should have? Basically, we usually talk of three major characteristics that a process should have. The first characteristic is what we refer to as the process lag. So as we have said, the process usually exhibit three important characteristics. One of them, the first one we can talk of the process load, not process lag. We can talk of the process load first. So when you talk of the process load, then this is usually referred to as the amount of the control agent that is needed to keep the process in a balanced condition. So whenever you have a process, for example, let's talk of a process like uh, maybe you can talk of a milk pasteurization plant. So maybe we can talk of the pipes that are used to heat the milk. So maybe you can talk of this one as a tank for the milk. And from there, these ones are the pipes that can be used. 
in order to carry out that, then you can have something like a valve here. So and this, this valve is supposed to let in, uh, so we are going to have steam in, and then from this side we can also have it out. Steam can be whatever after, so we can have the milk. Maybe the objective here is to ensure that the milk uh, is maintained at 60 degrees Celsius. So if that one is what is supposed to happen, then when with the reference to this a plant like this, then the process load is actually that amount of steam that will ensure that this particular milk is kept at 60 degrees Celsius. So like if you talk of the milk pasteurization plant, there is that certain steam that is needed in order to put the milk at a certain temperature. For our case, the set point was, it, the set, taking the set point at 60 degrees, so that particular amount of steam that is used to keep it at 60 degrees is what we refer to as the process uh, load. And when you talk of the control agent, the control agent can still be the manipulated variable. Like in this case, if we have, uh, what is it that we are controlling? We are controlling the temperature of the milk. What is it that is controlling the temperature of the milk? It is the steam. And therefore, you have the valve that opens and shuts depending on the conditions of the temperature. Maybe you can talk of the ambient temperature and so on and so forth. So the, the other one, the other important characteristic that we can talk about is what we refer to as the process lag. So number two is process lag. So process lag is just the difference in time. This is the time that it takes for a control variable to reach a new value after process load change. So for example, when you talk of the steam still, with our example of the milk pasteurization plant, if we talk of the steam, that particular time uh, that it will take before maybe there was a re reduction in temperature below 60 degrees, that time that it will take for the temperature to be taken back to 60 degrees, that time that it takes for the controlled variable to reach a new value for the temperature to change is what we refer to as uh, the process lag. And this one is after a process load change. When you change the load of the process, there will be a dif difference in time in which the change will be executed. And this time lag is always caused by three properties. The three properties that are responsible for this time lag are the first one we can talk of the capacitance. The capacitance. We can talk of the capacitance. The capacitance of a system is simply its ability or the ability of the particular system to store a quantity of energy. So when we have a large capacitance, it means that it takes more time for the process load to change. So large capacitance will take more time for a process load to change. The other uh, property that also determines the process lag is what we refer to as the resistance. The resistance. So the resistance is simply the opposition to the flow. And the, the resistance that we can be talking about in this case is thermal resistance. That will, which will not allow a smooth flow uh, of uh, whatever, uh, the control agent into that particular system. This is what we are referring to as uh, the resistance. Eh? Or we can talk about the dashboard. The other uh, characteristic is what we talk about as the transportation or dead time. Transportation or dead time. Transportation or dead time. This is the time it takes for a change to move from one place to another in the process. It's simply the time that it takes uh, for a change to move from one place to another in the process. And then we have the last characteristic, which is uh, stability. So we have the stability. And for the stability, each and every process is always, for stability, you can always talk about BIBO. That is the bounded input, bounded output. For a given input, there should be a given known output. Any given known input should give a given known output. Therefore, we can talk of stability. A system is said to be stable if it can be returned to the control. It, if uh, the, the controlled variable can be returned to a steady state value and 
Typically, an unstable system will cause a variable uh, to be oscillating, and this one can be above or below the desired value. So now we can continue and talk about uh, what we refer to as the industrial controllers. Industrial controllers. So when you talk about the industrial controllers, maybe we can remind ourselves of the block diagram of a control system. Here we usually have the controller. So then we have the actuator. Then here we can have a process or plant. process or plant, then here we can have a feedback or we can have what we call measuring means. Then that one goes to the comparator. So just reminding ourselves, so this one is the reference input. Then we have that. So just to remind ourselves, the controller is what we are talking about controller that we are talking about is here. So the main work of the controller is always to ensure that it uh, makes. The controller, first of all, is it usually does a little bit of amplification. And also, it always ensure that it makes the reference input to be as close as possible to the controlled output. And the way this one usually happen is always what is referred to as the modes of control. So the basic characteristic of a controller is always the way it acts in order to restore the control variable to its desired value. The different control actions is what you should refer to as the modes of control. And this one leads us to the common modes of control that are always in use. And in this case, we are going to make a reference to five modes of control. And later on, we'll talk about the several combinations of all this, taking the advantages and the disadvantages of each or where each and every one is applicable. So the first one, we can talk about uh, the two position, which is the simplest, two position control. And these ones are what now we refer to as the modes of control. Modes of control. And we've said that the modes of control is basically uh, how the controller acts in order to restore the control variable to its desired value. So the second one is floating, which is just a, 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 a modification of more of two position. Then we can also have the third one, which is uh, the proportional, the proportional mode. Then we can also have the fourth one, which is the integral integral mode. Then we have the fifth one, which is the, the derivative mode. Deriva, derivative mode. So the integral mode can at times be referred to as reset, and the derivative mode can at times be referred to as rate or preact. As well, refer to as the rate or PR. So these are the modes of control that we are going to look at first uh, before we can move to other. So we are going to look at each and every mode of control uh, one at a time, and then we see what is it that makes this particular mode of control uh, good or, or better than the other. And in that case, uh, that is what we are going to look at. So let's start by looking at two positions two position, two position control, two position control. So when you talk about two position control, this is the simplest and the most commonly used mode of control. And in this case, uh, the controller output only has two possible values. And this one is always dependent on the output curve of a two position controller. And the output curve of a two position controller is as shown. So we can talk about its output curve, whereby we can talk about it in terms of percentage. You can say that is 100. Then here we have uh, the neutral. We have the neutral zone here. This is what we refer to as the neutral zone.
then here maybe you can have a zero point there this side can be positive this side is negative then this is now the controller controller output and this one should be in percentage and this side is where we have the error this is what we refer to as the error so in this case that one is a good representation of input output curve of a two position control and basically the neutral zone is just a set of values around zero which the error must pass the error must pass this before any control action can take place so this is what we are referring to as the neutral zone and when we talk about uh, the two position the two position control usually supply energy in pulses L like a good example two position we can talk about uh, uh, something like uh, iron box huh? the iron box will always switch on and off depending on the temperature that you've set so in that case it will have it will generate pulses in the process and these pulses will usually co cycling of the control variable and the amplitude of the cycling is always dependent on, the th on three factors. One of the factors that it is dependent on is the capacitance of the process. The dead, second one is the dead time of the process and also the size of the load changes uh, that the system is capable of handling. So those are the three factors that uh, are always, that always determine the cycling of the two position. So the amplitude of the oscillation is decreased by either decrease, by either increasing the capacitance or decreasing the daytime lag or even decreasing the size of the load and it is for these reasons that the two position is only used on processes that have capacitance that are large enough to counteract the combined effects of both the daytime lag and the load change capability this one usually make the two position control uh, to be simple and cheap and it is always preferred whenever cycling can be reduced to an acceptable level a simple one a simple just as i've mentioned you can usually include a switch that turns on and off a heat supply you can talk of the iron box that uh, moves uh, that goes on depending on how it is set depending on the nature of uh, uh, whatever that uh, you are whatever type of uh, cloth that you are ironing so you will always say there is one place for the cotton there is the linen there is the polyester so after you've done that when the iron box heats up it it goes off by itself and that is what we are talking about as cycling and uh, the same can be applied as a simple uh, as by use of a simple heat supply uh, switch that puts on and off the heat. And this, this cycling usually uh, will be f changing with the temperature. And that is all as far as uh, the two position is concerned. If you want more materials, you can always make a reference to uh, the website, triple-es.education, triple-es.education. So that one, we, you will get uh, more materials from there as far as giving the examples of the cycling and, the and how it can be improved. Maybe one, another way of improving two position is always putting several points of switches. Huh? Instead of having now two, you can put the intermediate in between. And that one will always improve a two position. Like if you can talk of a good example of maybe three heat switch and so on. So that one you have several switching position. So that is as far as two position control is concerned. The second mode of control that uh, we're going to look at is floating control. Floating control. Number two is floating control. floating control so floating control is basically a special uh, application of two position control in which the final control element is always stationary as long as the error remains within the neutral zone so it will remain stationary anytime the error is within the neutral zone it is stationary but when the error uh, 
But when the, when, when the control variable now goes outside the neutral zone, the final control element usually changes at a constant rate. And this one is always in the direction that is determined by the sign of the error. So in this case, the final control element will continue to change until the error returns to the neutral zone or until the final control element reaches one of its extreme position. That is, it is either fully open or fully shut. This one can be represented by an input-output curve as shown. So this is the input-output curve for this. So you, what you can see is that the neutral zone it is there. So when uh, the error is within the neutral zone, it remains stationary. So we can talk of that as point zero. So this is the positive side, this is the negative side, and this is the error. So, and here we have what we refer to as the neutral zone. So here is the neutral zone. Then here is the final control element. We can also have this point to be zero. Then here we have positive, here we have negative. Then this is the final control element speed. Final control element speed. So what you can see is that whenever it is within the neutral zone, just as we said, it remains stationary. But when it goes uh, outside the neutral zone, it goes to the extreme ends, depending on the sign of the error. If it is positive, it goes in that direction. If it is negative, it goes in that direction. Again, the floating control has the tendency to produce cycling, just like uh, the two position, because we say that it is a special application of of two position control. So just like the two position, it has the tendency to produce cycling of the control variable with the amplitude depending on the daytime, lag of the process, the capacitance of the process, and the speed at which the controller increases and decreases the final control element. The main advantage of this uh, floating control is that it has got the ability to handle large load changes and this is done by gradually adjusting the final control element. And this makes the floating control to be used especially when large load changes are anticipated and the capacitance is large enough to counteract the effects of the daytime lag and the speed of the final control element. So that is what the floating control is.